Socrates, a biography by George Norlin. At the age of 97, a year before his death, Isocrates published his Anathenaicus, one of the most ambitious of his discourses. He had been interrupted in the composition of it by a three years illness and it was only upon the urgency of his friends that he rose above his weakness and carried it through to completion. It is not up to the level of his earlier work. His powers have manifestly declined. Above all, the strong vanity of his artistic temperament, whose frank expression elsewhere often offends the modern reader, here falls into a senile querulousness as he sees the labours of his otherwise fortunate life failing of universal approval and acclaim. Yet the discourse is remarkable not so much for its senility as for his unflagging devotion to Athens. It is significant that the last discourse, as well as the first great effort of his career, the Pangericus, extols the noble history of the city of his forefathers. Love of Athens is the one passion of his dispassionate nature. And second only to this is his love of Hellas. Of Greece. Or rather, both these feelings are blended into a single passion, a worship of Hellenism as a way of life. It's a saving religion of which he conceives Athens to be a central shrine and himself a prophet commissioned by the very gods to reconcile the quarrels of the Greeks and unite them in a crusade against the barbarian world. The course of events during the distressing period of history through which he lived accorded badly with his dreams. His own writings, as well as those of his contemporaries, reflect the fatal incapacity of the Greek city-state either to, to surrender any degree of its autonomy in the interest of a national unity, or to leave inviolate the autonomy of other states. Athens, Sparta and Thebes, each in turn, held for a time a place of supremacy, only to provoke by aggression general hatred and rebellion. The several states came to feel more bitter against each other than their common enemy, the Persian Empire, and did not scruple to court the favour and use the aid of the great Persian king in their selfish rivalries and wars. Indeed, the hope of a united Hellas became more and more the shadow of a shadow, until at last all of Greece, exhausted and demoralised by mutual warfare, submitted herself perforce to the leadership of Philip of Macedon. Yet Isocrates never, to the end of his life, gave up his purpose, and it was doubtless this disinterested enthusiasm for a great cause, together with unusual, quote, health of body and soul, end quote, and a degree of philosophical detachment from the heat and dust of conflict to ex extended the span of his life over a century of extraordinary vicissitudes and disenchantment. Much of the tradition regarding his life must be received with caution by historians. The formal biographies of him which have come down to us are of a late compilation, and which gossip is so often confused with fact that we can safely credit them only when their statements are confirmed by his contemporaries or by Isocrates himself. Isocrates was born in 436 before the Christian era, five years before the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, and he died in 338 BCE after the Battle of Chironia. He was one of five children, four boys and one girl. Of his mother, we know only that her name was Heduto. His father, Theodorus, carried on a business in the manufacture of making flutes, and was a prosperous enough person to perform expensive services for the state so as to give his children a good education. Isocrates says in the Antidosis that he himself had such advantages in this regard as to give him greater prominence among his fellow students than he later enjoyed among his fellow citizens. This little is all we know with any degree of certainty about his formal training. We have from his biographers the tradition that he profited not only by the established education of the Athenian youth of his time, but also by the new learning which the sophists had introduced as a preparation for citizenship and practical success. Indeed, 
He is said to have gone to school to almost all of the professors of wisdom of his generation, which can be true only in the sense that he made himself acquainted with all of the intellectual forces which were stirring in his day and was stimulated by their influence. He has, however, a rather clear relationship to two of the greatest teachers of this period. One of these was Georgias of Leontini, the most renowned sophist of the rhetorical school under whom it was likely that he was at one time a student. Georgius had visited Athens as a special ambassador from Leontini in 427 before the Christian era, when Isocrates was a boy, and had then carried the Athenians off their feet by the brilliance of his oratory, an oratory that was hardly prose, but more akin to poetry, rhythmical, ornate, and making its appeal not only to the intellect, but the senses and the imagination as well. Later, he spent some time in Athens, where his lectures were immensely popular. Next, we hear of him as the orator at the Olympic Festival of 408 BCE, pleading with the assembled Greeks to reconcile their quarrels and unite in a war against the barbarians. Afterwards, he settled down in Thessaly, where Isocrates is said to have heard his lectures. Isocrates was, without a doubt, greatly influenced by Georgias. He probably owes to his teaching and his example the idea which he later made peculiarly his own, namely that the highest oratory should concern itself with broad pan-Hellenic themes and that the style of oratory should be as artistic as that of poetry and afford the same degree of pleasure. But when we attempt to estimate definitively what he took from Georgias in matter of style, we are on uncertain ground. The speeches of Georgias, which startled his contemporaries, are now lost, and we owe the fragments of them which we possess to the accident of their having been quoted to illustrate the extreme qualities of his rhetoric. If we may judge by these alone, his oratory sought to depart as far as possible from the language of common speech. It was as artificial as poetry, and even more bold in its diction, its imagery, its figures, and its constant effort to strike a grand note. In fact, Georgius attempted to be as Pindar or as an Aeschylus, but in prose. His untamed rhetoric had its close analogue in the exuberant style of the Elizabethan age, in which we have not only a poetic metaphor, alliteration and balanced antithesis, but also a close parallelism in sound assonance, which is even rarer in poetry. Now, Isocrates did not attempt the grand manner, and did, in fact, avoid the Georgian excesses of style. He uses the Georgian antitheses, both of language and of thought, with better effect and with more concealing artifice, and he employs alliteration and assonance with greater continence. He abstains, even, to excess from the language of metaphor, and he very seldom uses poetical or obsolete words or unusual compounds, confining himself, rather, to the words of current speech, using them with nice procession and combining them in a manner to produce an effect of dignity and of distinction. Blass quotes an illustration of the sentence of the Evagoras, where the difference between language of Isocrates and a bold statement is that he killed many of the Persians is a difference not of diction, but of the imagination. While Georgias relies for his effect upon striking words and phrases, Isocrates insubordinates the individual words and clauses to a larger unity. He is an architect, looking to the effect of the whole edifice, not that of single bricks or stones, and taking infinite pains with composition, the smooth joining of part to other part. He avoids studiously the clash of harsh consonants and all the coll collocations of vowels at the end of the beginning of a successive word hiatus, and he has everywhere an ear sensitive to rhythm, not exactly recurring rhythms of, as verse, but such as to carry the voice buoyantly through the sentence upon wave after wave of sound without obtruding themselves upon the attention of the audience. For melody and rhythm are for Isocrates as important to artistic prose as it is to poetry. The structural unit in Isocrates is the involved periodic sentence. 
This is extraordinarily long, sometimes occupying an entire page for a single sentence and very often half a page, but it is so skillfully built that the parts in relation to one another and to the whole are easily grasped. For Isocrates, no matter how often he balances clause against clause to round out his period, is always clear. The reader, however, even while he's marvelling at the architecture of the ancient Greek of Isocrates, is apt at times to weary of it, especially when Isocrates is so concerned about the symmetry of the sentence that he weakens the thought by padding, and in straining for the effect of amplitude becomes diffuse and tedious. Isocrates is no less careful in the transitions from sentence to sentence, from division to division of the discourse. All is smooth and arranged according to a plan. He doesn't dwell too long upon any single aspect of his subject, lest he fatigue the mind of the listener. He opens with a short sort of prelude, which is not too closely pertinent to the theme and digresses judiciously for the sake of variety. But all the parts of the discourse are rigorously subordinated to the design of an organic whole. Thus, Isocrates took from Georgias a style which was extremely artificial and made it artistic. In so doing, he fixed the form of rhetorical prose for the Greek world and, through the influence of Marcus Tullius Cicero, for all modern times as well. And if the style of Georgias is lost, something of its brilliance and its fire in it being subdued by Isocrates to the restraints of art, perhaps that loss is compensated by the serenity and the dignity of that eloquence which Dionysius urged all young oristers to study who are ambitious to serve the state in any meaningful way. That's Dionysius of Halicarnassus, naturally. And which Boussade singled out as a model for oratory for the Christian church. The other teacher who left his impression upon Socrates was the philosopher Socrates. In the conversation at the close of Plato's Phaedrus, where Isocrates is mentioned as Socrates' companion, Socrates speaks with warm admiration of his brilliant qualities, and he prophesies from a very, a very distinguished future for, his, for him in the field of oratory or in the field of philosophy, and should, quote, some divine impulse, unquote, lead him in that direction. The passage indicates that there was at one time a close relationship between the young Isocrates and his teacher, nor is there any reason to doubt that Isocrates cherished throughout his life the warm feeling for the philosopher, the studied effort with which he echoes the striking features of Socrates' defence in his own Apologia pro vita sua, the antidosis, is evidence enough of his high regard for Socrates. Furthermore, certain characteristics of his life and work reflect the influence of Socrates, his aloofness from public life his critical attitude towards the excesses of Athenian democracy and his hatred of demagogues, his contempt for the sham pretensions of some of the sophists, that is, the teachers of his day, his logical clearness and his insistence on the proper definition of objectives and terms, his prejudice against the speculations of philosophy on the origin of things as being completely fruitless, his feelings that ideas are of value only as they can be translated into action, and that education should be practical and aim at right conduct in public and private life. His rationalism in religion, combined with the acquiescence in the forms of worship, his emphasis upon ethics and his earnest morality, now the prudential morality of Socrates, of Xenophon, again the idealistic morality of the Socrates of Plato, all of these he has in common with his master. If Georgias intoxicated him with the possibilities of style, Socrates was a sobering influence and touched upon his life more deeply. If we may rely upon the essential truth of the half-playful words of Socrates in Plato's Phaedrus, two careers beckon to one who possessed the genius and promise of Isocrates, that of the orator and that of the philosopher. Each, however, at once attracted and repelled him. The one tended to plunge him into conflict of the practical politics from which his sensitive nature shrank. The other led him to the realm of purely fanciful ideas to which his practical sense attached no value whatever. 
In the end, his attempt of being a philosopher and a statesman in one, avoiding what he regarded as the extremes of both, he endeavoured to direct the affairs of Athens and of Greece without ever holding an office, and to mould public opinion without ever addressing the public assembly by issuing from his study political pamphlets or essays in oratical form in which he set forth the proper conduct of the Greeks in the light of broad ideas. The result of this dwelling was on the borderland between politics and philosophy. This was not altogether happy for Isocrates. In the Panathenaikos we see a disappointed old man. He had been shut out from the fellowship of either camp. He had missed the zest of the fighting. Like Demosthenes in the press of Athenian affairs, and he had been denied the consolation of retiring, like Plato, into a city of his dreams. 